that's the reference. Episode one, Joe introduced this to me and to us as a, something he learned from Warren Buffett. It was a business so easy to run, even a ham sandwich could do it. Yeah. And I think he referred to it as like, you want to buy a business that your idiot nephew could run it. Because um, <laughs> eventually he will. I'm Roberto, engineer turned PGA tour player turned businessman. And I'm Dan, businessman on the weekdays and average golfer on the weekends. On the Course Record Show, we talk to some of the smartest people in the golf business and get the inside stories and strategies driving the business of golf forward. All right, welcome. Today on the Course Record Show, we are joined by Joe Ogilvy, our first repeat guests. Joe was our first guest on the Course Record Show. He had a long career on the PGA Tour. He is currently a partner at Wallace Capital, a private investment firm. Uh, the first time Joe visited us, we focused on life on the PGA Tour, the business of professional golf. Today, we're going to cover the more business side of golf, some companies that are in the golf industry, and get his perspective and take as a professional investor. Joe, thanks again for being on. It's great being here, guys. Thanks for having me on again. So we're going to tee up some companies, give a little bit of background. This conversation started as who owns these companies, right? A lot of private equity, a lot of some have been public, some have been private. So we did a little research, and then we'll dive into some questions. And uh, and again, get your take as a professional investor. We are going to start with Golf Galaxy. Golf Galaxy is owned by Dick Sporting Goods. They purchased the firm in 2007 for $225 million. At the time, they had 65 stores and about $265 million in sales. Along the way, Dick's bought Golfsmith out of bankruptcy in 2014, keeping 30 of their stores and shuttering 70. Today, and this is why we're starting with Golf Galaxy and Dick's Sporting Goods, Dick's trades for $110. When the bug bit in 2000, the stock dipped to $16. In the euphoric 2021 market, $140. The doldrums of 2022, $75. And today it's back to $110. So what do you think about Golf Galaxy as a business, their parent company, Dick Sporting Goods, and that wild ride of the stock? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. So I have the little history here. When I first moved to Austin, Texas in 1999, I, I was this naive rookie on the PGA Tour. I didn't know a whole lot of people in Austin. I didn't know any golfers. Um, and my home golf course, and I look back at this, and, and this is this is really funny. My home golf course was the driving range at Golfsmith on I-35, which literally, like, I would bring my staff bag up to the driving range. And Golfsmith, they, I mean, the Paul family ran it, and it was a perfectly fine range. But, I mean, it had striped you know, pinnacles is range balls had no chipping green. And this was my home, home club. I mean, that's where I practiced, which is kind of why I didn't have a great, um, a stellar, uh, freshman season on the PGA tour, but <laughs> you know, these, um, these, these, these single family, I guess golf galaxy probably has a little tennis bin. I haven't been in, in one in a while, but you know, you think about golf galaxy, you think about the PGA tour superstore, um, to a certain extent, these companies, um, the good news is some of these retail big box stores have all gone out of business. So it's, it's cheaper to rent. They need, they need, um, they need some big retailers to go in there, but it is a, it's a very difficult business. And, you know, they obviously compete with the green grass, your, your local country clubs and your local stores. Um, there's a little bit of a direct to consumer, but what these things have done now is they have these hitting bays in there. And so you can, in theory, get fitted. And so it's a little, they're, they're trying to go a little bit more upscale, a little bit more personal. Um, most of the big box retailers aren't real personal. So it's a really tough business. I mean, it's a, the golf retailer is, it, it's difficult. The margins are just okay, I would say. But golf has, as you said, I mean, golf has had a has a bit of a renaissance here, and you've got more and more people trying to, you know, buy a game. And um, but it's tough. I wouldn't want to own it. So, Joe, I, I didn't know about the ownership though. I, I thought Golf Galaxy was its own thing. I didn't know that Dick's owned them, let alone that Golfsmith got rolled up in there too. What about this roll up approach? Like, I mean, you talk about it as being a tough business. Does the roll-up approach make sense with some of the dynamics you see in the business here? You know, I think the roll-up approach, Golf Galaxy, I don't know the entire history, but, you know, they bought Golf Smith out of bankruptcy. Um, the Paul family, who I'm, who I'm friends with, 
they actually sold it at a, at a, at a pretty darn good price. And then, you know, through recessions or whatever, it, it um, slowly went uh, bankrupt. But um, when you're rolling things up and you're buying them out of bankruptcy, it's a little bit different, right? You're taking out a competitor, you're kind of consolidating the market. And that makes, in theory, it should make margins a little bit better. Um, th this is a market where you, you really, you don't want a whole lot of competitors because it is relatively thin. Um, especially now that you can buy things on the internet. And, and um, so it's really, um, the internet is always going to be a competitor now to these to these local retailers. You're, you're not going to have as many. I mean, if you look at the golf shop, I mean, there's not a whole lot of inventory. It used to be you'd have, you know, 10 or 12 full sets at, a, at, your, at your local country club or a, or a public golf course. You don't have that anymore. I mean, it's all, it's all, um, it's kind of made to order. So um it, it, it's it's still a tough business, but you you definitely the roll up standpoint. It almost had to be done because it's 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 difficult. All right, I'll take the other side for two reasons. One, I think sporting goods and any item that you want to touch and feel is the last bastion of retail. People still want to touch and feel golf clubs. And yeah. then another thing, I know that country clubs and you say Greengrass is a competitor. They don't carry inventory in hard goods anymore. The yeah. country club now will do a million dollars in hard goods with zero inventory, which is pretty cool. It's all custom order, all special order. But at the end of the day, a lot of folks, they want to walk out with that driver. They want that dopamine hit. They want to go touch and feel it and take it home that day. So I think golf retailers, and then I'll add a third to that. Like you said, adding these hitting bays and making it more experiential where you're playing leagues out of there, you're getting lessons out of there. You're not just getting fit. They first put these hitting bays into these shops just to get fit for clubs, but there's a lot more that you can do with that. And if I lived in Boston here, like my co-host, I would be spending a lot of time in the winter in a, and you know, some of these PGA tour superstar golf galaxies, they really have kitted out these stores. It's a, it's a good spot. No, it, it look, the PGA tour superstore is, I mean, I happen to go there more than I go to a golf galaxy or, a, you know, I'll walk around Dick's every now and again, just to I go, I walk around a lot of retailers just to go see what what's going on and things like that. I mean, I mean, they, they've done a lot better job, but it, it's still a, I mean, look at the end of the day, you're buying a new set of clubs or a new set of irons. There's not a whole lot of, you know, my, my, my previous sponsors would probably kill me for this, but there's not a whole lot of giant innovation on an iron, in my opinion. Um, and so it, it, it truly is a bull market buy, right? I mean, you're not going to go spend, I mean, I looked at following the prices on clubs now, and I mean, some of these custom made clubs are, you know, kind of out of hand. And um, I mean, I don't know. I, I think if I practiced a little bit more, um, my, my, my game would improve. It's kind of like if I have the third cheeseburger, I'm going to get fatter. I mean, you know, you, um, you, you can, uh, you can, you can help yourself in golf, I think. And, and, and a lot of times when you start getting into recessions and you start getting um, a little bit harder economic times, you're not going to buy the golf, you're not going to buy golf clubs. And so it's just, it's just a really difficult business, I think. So we talked about sort of two models here, right? The, the green grass model being low inventory, potentially high service, the sort of big box model where Golf Galaxy fits in being high inventory, perhaps lower service. The model we haven't talked about that combines the low inventory with the high service are these like very niche, like fitting places, right? Like your club champions, your true specs, et cetera, where they, they, so they sort of found a way to give you that personalized, the dopamine hit that Roberto talked about, right? Where you're really in a, in a toy store for, for golf nuts like, like us. And then, um, but also, you know, it's made to order you ship it somewhere and it's sent and it's very very uh not so capital intensive because of that so i, I would think in an environment like we're now with with high interest rates where working capital inventory becomes so taxing on a company like that model i would think really thrives what do you think about that well i i think you're right and i guess what was it Roberto? was was taylor made the first one to come out with the with the shaft that's interchangeable in the in the driver head i think i think were, it was taylor made yeah um and so you know that that made it really easy for these for the for the um, for that retailer, the highly specialized retailer. You know, you're switching in and out of shafts. And TaylorMade really became, I mean, that innovation alone really caused the customization of golf to really ramp. Um, I, I forget when that was. Maybe it was 2007 or eight or you know somewhere around in there. That's about uh, right. Because when I was in college, the the companies would come fit us and everything was built and you had to order it. And if it didn't work, you threw it in the trash, which is crazy. And yeah, then they no. start, 
So yeah. it's, you're probably right. Late 2000s was when that technology emerged. Yeah. And so you know, the, the, the first highly customizable um, place, it was in Phoenix, Scottsdale area. And I'm trying to think of the name of it. Cool clubs. Uh, cool clubs. That's exactly right. Cool clubs. And then so you had this and then then everybody figured out, oh, well, if you can, you know, customize and, and change the driver shaft right there, it starts to work. And I, and I think that I think that service I mean, every city now has their own guy. In Austin, we have this guy named Bobby Dean who sits on the driving range at Martin Creek, and he kind of customizes your, you know, your whole set. And it's, and it's really, um, it's it's really really good. But so you got Golf Galaxy, and you've got Cool Clubs, and you've got all these things. They're competing against the Bobby Deans of the world, the entrepreneur that's that knows his bottom line. He's he's the guy, right? I mean, he's the guy that's doing all this. He's leave, um, eating and breathing this stuff. And that entrepreneur is really, really hard to compete with, um, especially at the high end, right? I mean, Bobby Dean's getting the guys in Austin that, that might be buying a new set of clubs every single year. And that incremental demand is being taken away from the golf galaxies or the cool clubs or the club champions of the world. And, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, you know, capitalism is really, really hard. And capitalism, when... You know, you go back to the no inventory, to your point, capitalism is extremely hard when there's no startup costs um, because you just get, you know, it's just the, the competition's hard. And, you know, so that's another, that's another reason why, I mean, look, if I'm a fanatic and I'm a Bobby Dean, okay, I want to compete against these things because I'm a, I'm, I'm a fanatic. I love this kind of stuff. But if I'm just a guy who wants to buy a business and have someone else run it, Man, I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna get my I'm gonna get I'm gonna get eaten alive by these by these young scrappy um, and these fanatical entrepreneurs. And so um, I mean I love as a golfer I love having these guys um, there and having you know for me being able to go there and get fitted. I know I'm getting fitted really really well, but from a business perspective, it's difficult. Interesting thing about the uh, interchangeable shafts ties back to golfsmith you'd have to think that basically put them out of business because when we were kids golfsmith was where you went to fix your clubs and be a club maker and you know like you'd buy a driver and if it wasn't working you'd reshaft it and you would go to golfsmith to either do it yourself or have it done and when you started screwing the heads and shafts on and off i would have to think so 2014 was when dicks bought golfsmith out of bankruptcy and that timing matches up right it's crazy yeah, it does. I mean, and there's going to be a lag, right? And so for right on Taylor May coming out with the yeah. adjustable shafts in 2008, 9, 10, whenever that was, you know, there's going to be a lag in four or five years probably makes sense. Yep. All right, Joe, let's bottom line it. Golf Galaxy. Are you buying or are you selling? I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm selling. You know, look, you always buy at the right price, but I, I, I don't think I'm buying at this price. All right, All right. There you have it. That's fair. All right, we'll jump to Soft Goods, a company we're all familiar with, Peter Millar. Who yeah. owns Peter Millar? They are owned by Richemont, the global luxury brands conglomerate. Total revenue for Richemont in their last fiscal year, $19 billion, $3.3 billion operating profit, $4.6 billion cash flow. The luxury biz is booming. For those of you at home, Richemont is made up of Cartier would be their most famous brand. They also have Van Cleef and Arpel, really, really high-end jewelry. They have a specialty watchmaking division for all you watch guys out there and gals. Panerai, JLC, Piaget, Vacheron, IWC. So pretty much all of the niche uh, specialty watchmakers. They have a category called Other on their balance sheet where Peter Millar fits in. Total revenue for Other was $2 billion. So if we had to guess at what part Millar makes up, maybe in the 500 to 1 billion revenue, it's, those are really small brands that fit into other. Uh, backstory on Peter Millar is pretty fascinating. Founded in 2001 with one item, a cashmere sweater. They were sold to the Sea Island Company, yes, the resort in, on the Georgia coast, in 2005, who sold them to a private equity firm in 2009. Their longtime CEO, Scott Mahoney, was quoted in an article as saying, Sea Island gave them credibility and private equity gave them financial discipline. In 2012, Richemont acquired Peter Millar and owns them today. So, Joe, uh, what do you like about this business? What do you think has been their key to success? 
and uh, where does it go from here? Well, I mean, I think Peter Millar, number one, they make they make very good clothing. They they have that southern, you know, I would say elegant preppy look. Um, Johan Rupert, who runs Richemont, um, the South African, he bought it. He's a big golfer. Um, and, you know, I think they've been fairly good with their, I happen to, full disclosure, I happen to wear Peter Millar probably four or five years on the PGA Tour. Um, and you're right, they made great cashmere sweaters. I mean, um, really, really good. I, li- I like them. Um, but no, it's, it's, a, it's a very good company. It's interesting, you know, fitting it inside of Richemont. It's, uh, uh, as you said, I mean, Jiga Lacorte is a great watch. They, they own the brand Chloe. They own Dunhill, uh, which Johan Rupert sponsors uh, the Dunhill Cup. But it's, um, I, I, I like the brand. I think I think what they're doing in golf and the green grass part is is very, very good. Um, and you can find them in all over the place. Cause so it's, they've, they've kind of, they've split the, they split the hair on, and you see non-golfers wearing them because they're in Nordstrom and they're in they're in Neiman Marcus and then, then they're in some retailers. They have standalone retailers now. And so it's good. It's 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 a it's a great brand. I like it. And I think they their distribution's out of Raleigh, North Carolina, or at least it used to be. Yeah. Um and so they might be I, I doubt they're a billion in sales, but they're probably, you know, they might be five or six hundred million in sales. Yeah. Uh, 21 standalone retail stores today. 21 stand. Yeah. So we have one in Austin. I've been to a few of them. They're, they're, they're very good, but like everything retailer, they've had, they've had trouble getting an inventory um, this year. So they, they probably have sold a lot less. And I've noticed that, especially from the cashmere standpoint and from some of their higher end stuff, um, the, the quality is, is, is okay. It's not quite as what it used to be. I think. Yeah. I think one interesting thing about Peter Millar's going back is it's a story of like betting on people, right? It's like the people that grew that company, they started. So I was at golf club of Georgia in the early two thousands, which was back then just crazy high end. And every spring they would bring in this table and put this like Skittles palette of Peter Millar cashmere sweaters. And that's all they did. They started with one item. So if you were like betting, like what apparel company is over the next 20 years, is going to become a behemoth. You would have said like, not the little set cashmere sweater company, right? Like you wouldn't have bet on the product, but the people behind it, Mahoney, that whole crew, like Chris, not, they took it to the next level. So I think it's really interesting seeing where they, cause we see all these niche, niche brands pop up now or like they're making a colored golf glove, which brings us to G4. That's where G4 started. Malar acquired them in 2018. So Dan is the one who, dug up that info and i think that's interesting and worth digging into a little bit yeah no i think that's right i mean look ralph lorenz started in new york with with ties i mean he started he got into yep. the wall street set and got into the fashion with, with just a with just ties he made really really good ties and then he kind of expanded that brand but you're right it goes back to all of these companies started with that single entrepreneur and that fanatic that was just gonna you know it's a we call them we call them fanatics we call them um you know, we're looking at a company, we're looking for the maverick fiduciary, but we're really looking for that guy who, or that girl who is just going, who's a force of nature and is going to take that brand and is not going to be stopped and is just going to force it. And so the question is, you know, can you invest in that entrepreneur and what happens when that entrepreneur is no longer there and they hand off their baby to the corporate giant? And so what, what happens then? And do you have that corporate giant? Is the corporate giant going to absorb that company and kind of put it into their, you know, their matrix and, and lose the culture and lose the, that, uh, that part of the brand that makes everyone say, wow, I want, I want some of that. Or are they going to kind of leave it or do they have a decentralized structure? And I think Richemont sort of has this decentralized structure to a certain extent where you still, you keep the, you keep the essence of the company and you keep the guys who, or the girls who you, who were running the company and you keep them running it and doing what they do best. And, you know, that's, that's, that's the key thing, right? Um, you want, you, you don't, if you, if you were going to buy, golly, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know a great example here, but if you were going to buy, I mean, what Buffett does is he buys a company and he just says, look, I'm buying the company and I'm buying management. And he really doesn't want to buy the company if management's going to leave. You know, when he bought BNSF, he had Matt Rose running the company 
It's like, look, man, I want you to run the company. I'm going to pay you plenty. Um, but I, I, I bought this, but I also bought the management team. And I, I want to keep that intact. You just send me the dollars that you make, or you tell me how much you want of the dollars that you make to, to improve the moat. And we'll kind of go from there. And that's what, um, you know, that's what that, that's, that's the key to all of these brands is if you're, if the, if the entrepreneur is going to run them and they're going to be the fanatic forever, that's great. And that brand could grow. Um, but if they're going to end up selling to a conglomerate or a larger company, what happens? And does that larger company say, I'm going to put this in the machine and I don't really care. The brand is what the brand is. And I'm not worried about the culture and all that kind of stuff. There's, it's a, it's a, it's a really delicate thing. Um, and it's very difficult to get right. So well, let's get like, I mean, let's pull a thread there. I mean, I hear you in terms of like the, the, the niche brand selling to the big machine and losing some of that special touch. Right. I totally hear that. Right. But we're talking about Rishima here and some of these brands are like very luxury high end. We're like the, we wouldn't say that IWC or Panerai have gone big and lost the ability to have that magic touch. That's what really scratches my head here is like, why, why does Peter Millar going through this cycle when it's being managed along with these other brands that are so carefully curated and almost think of as thought of as this forbidden fruit? Yeah, I think that it's interesting. And I, so I don't know how Peter Millar has been consolidated inside of Richemont, but you know, most of the, most of, I mean, Richemont is headquartered in Switzerland, um, even though it's kind of South African owned. There, a lot of their brands are Swiss and European based, and, and Peter Millar is still, I believe, still kind of U.S. centric, and they haven't, they haven't deviated too much from their from their secret sauce. Um, so, and I don't even know who's running Peter Millar right now, but it, it, but it does seem like some of these. I mean, the European fashion houses are really good at kind of plugging these brands in and let them i i don't know i mean you look at lvmh and what Ar arnaud's done and what um keurig's done who owns um or curing who's done gucci and and a few different brands and, and so that they're very good at plugging these things in and so i don't know maybe maybe they're just better at it um i mean lvmh buying tiffany that's a that's an american brand that they've done very well with so far um so I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's European. Maybe it's maybe Europeans are better at stewarding these brands. Um, that's a little aggressive, but I mean, I think that they're. I think the fashion houses are pretty good at that. The brand capital is unbelievable. Like I was reading a book about Ralph Lauren, and they're talking about Balenciaga, like the person in the fifties, right? And like now in like street culture and rap videos, like all anyone wears is Balenciaga shoes. Like just taking something from zero, like Peter Millar did. It's a made up name, essentially to where it is today is really the outlier. It's, it's the exception. It's not the rule. Most of these are heritage brands that have either been dusted up and rekindled or, you know, Chanel and Gucci and Louis, like they're 200 year old, 150, 100 year old brands that have maintained that cachet. So Ralph Lauren's um, son and daughters, so son David and daughter Dylan went to Duke and the head pro at Duke University Golf Club was in there and Ralph Lauren was staying at the Washington Duke Hotel and went into the golf shop and he was looking at, you know, the Ralph Lauren clothing and there was Ralph Lauren clothing on the discount rack. And he walked in there and he said, look, who's, who's, who runs this shop? And the guy goes, I do. And he goes, we don't put our brand on the discount rack. Um, so if you're going to do that, you're no longer going to have our brand. And he goes, I'm sorry, who are you? And he goes, I'm Ralph Lauren. And the guy's like, oh, <laughs> let me ask you a question. How would you, you know, portray your clothing here? And he went in, you know, he's very nice. He went in for like a 15 or 20 minute like dissertation on this is why we're a high end brand. And this is why we don't discount. And, the, you know, the brand is the brand is elevated and, and that's what we want our brand to be. And so it was no longer on the discount rack when the next time he visited his uh, son and daughter. But it's, I think it's very interesting how these brands think. I mean, you'll never see, I mean, Louis, Louis Vuitton, I'll never forget in 2008, 2009, when you had the massive sell off, I mean, they, they burned their bags. I think maybe yeah. they disposed of them in a more environmental friendly, friendly manner, but they didn't, they didn't, it didn't go to TJ Maxx. It didn't go to, you know, and I think that that, that part of the brand, I mean, that's what happened to Under Armour, right? I mean, Under Armour was this great, great brand. And you looked at it, they, people thought of Under Armour clothing, clothing, 
in a little bit higher regard than they thought of Nike and things like that. But then they went completely discount. I think they went to Col- they went to put it in Kohl's. And you're like, why would you destroy your brand by putting it in Kohl's? Perfectly nice retailer, but you don't go to Kohl's thinking like, oh, I'm going to buy something nicer than Nike and Kohl's. And they they literally ruined their brand with that or hurt their brand with that one decision. And, um, you know, I think the Europeans do a very, very good job of stewarding the, you know, just the, just the brand and the, in the, in the, the power of that brand. Yeah. Roberto teased G4 a little bit. Can yeah. you guys entertain me down a little bit of a tangent here? Because when, when yeah. we were picking brands to go down, Roberto picked Peter Millar, I picked G4, and then realized, oh, well, it all pulls yeah. up together. But um, but they're, but they're, I thought this was fascinating. So um, so we know Peter Millar acquired G4 in 2018. Roberto covered that. But who 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 started, who owned G4 before the acquisition? Do you guys oh. know that? Someone that wanted his daughter in, um, wasn't his <laughs> daughter a uh, rower? I mean, a great, an elite rower. Elite, uh, absolutely elite, elite. Elite rower. <laughs> in that she'd been in a boat once. <laughs> she, she'd been on a yacht and um, that had a motor, but nevertheless. Um, All right, Dan, fill us in. <laughs> so it's it's the, the previous owner was and founder was Massimo Giannulli. And Massimo Giannulli, Famous for a couple of things. He was famous for starting the Massimo brand. It was huge in the 90s when we were kids, yeah. right? And then they went to Target and whatever, and they kind of lost its allure. But uh, but that was a big brand that took me way back in the, to my childhood there. I don't know about the rowing bit, but Massimo and his wife later got into trouble because they're, they fact- were caught in that whole college admission scandal. Yeah. So Massimo spent spent five years in jail. or sorry, five, five, months. Five, months in, five months in jail, excuse me. Uh, spent some time there. And um, after he had sold the brand to Peter Millar, so I uh, I thought the story was too fascinating not to share. But now, colored gloves is how it started. Took on a whole new line, Millar. Now Rochemont's got it. So it's it's all comes full circle there. Yeah, they, they and they started off with gloves, and they went to great golf shoes. I mean, they've got these golf shoes. Have you have you ever worn G four golf shoes? They've got this like thing in the bottom like where this where the uh what do you call it the insert they're like little ridges i mean it feels terrific on your foot i've only had one pair of them but they really are they're really nice they were kind of rocking the like west coast look and then the shoes is really what they've taken off with right so like who can predict what how these companies grow and what what products they find that connect with the market i mean i would have thought it was kind of trendy apparel that would they would continue to lean on but shoes right i mean it's crazy i mean i would love to i don't know if there's a book that has like the human psychology to a skull but you look at skulls i mean like you got the oakland raiders but then g4 i mean you have skulls everywhere like it's got skulls in their shoes and skulls in their belts and you got skulls 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 then there's this thing liquid death which is water but liquid death and which kind of insinuates skulls i there must be something in the human condition that just thinks oh my gosh this is this is really great fashion yeah it's called it's called poor taste joe that's that's called. okay good yeah 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 well anyway i want to read a book on it because it's fascinating to me but yeah g4 um and it just, you know peter millar it fits and that's where probably and i could be wrong on this but that's where probably Johan, the, the the Peter Millar people were just like, look, we need, we want to expand in golf shoes. We want to expand in in various things. This is a good brand. It's hot. It kind of fits our fits our deal, and that's why they bought it. Maybe. Well, I could talk about uh, apparel and accessories and retail for about four hours, but we'll have to move on to the next one here. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to get in a fashion. No, uh, Dan, Dan, close it with buy or sell. That's right. Let's do that every time. All right. So if there was a carve out of Peter Millar. Joe, are you buying or selling the brand? You know, I actually, I think I'd probably buy that one for the right price. It's all comes, <laughs> Dan, it all comes down to price. <laughs> value guy, you and Warren, value guys. Value yeah. guys. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly. Value guys. Unless it goes into Kohl's and then I'm out. Well, okay, I was going to avoid this because like I said, but the only person that's really done that well or did it well for 50 years was Ralph, right? He got the Lauren, Ralph Lauren, like lower brand, he got into uh, 
you know, home, which you could buy at like Kohl's or Macy's or what, like somehow he managed to sell purple label and pillowcases. And to me, he's just the most incredible retailer of the last uh, he's, years. He's incredible, but he didn't put Ralph Lauren. It was Lauren, right? You're right. I, mean, I know, but that's, that's a pro move. It's a pro move. And Purple never went to, into his retail outlets or uh, not retail, his never like his, uh, what do you call them? Um, discount outlets, the, 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 um, outlet the malls. Outlet yeah, yeah. The outlet. So he had a, almost a separate brand for that. Yeah. Like a specific. And so, I mean, it was really well. I mean, he, he's, you're right. He's, he's amazing. All right. Moving to real estate, Club yes. Corp which has rebranded as Invited, but we're going to call it Club Corp for now. Okay. They are owned by Apollo Global Management, purchased in 2017 for $1.1 billion. They also assumed about a billion of debt. That was 30% above the share price. And I saw a couple articles from early and late this year that they are considering an IPO of about $4.5 billion. They have 161 golf and country clubs, another 30 city and sport clubs, they also own Big Shots, which is kind of an up and coming top golf competitor. Interesting thing about Apollo, it's kind of a who's who in private equity. Started in 1990, they're an alternative asset manager. Leon Black, who has gotten a lot of newspaper ink, Mark Rowan is still the CEO. Josh Harris owns the New Jersey Devils and the Philadelphia 76ers. And Tony Ressler, who owns my hometown team. Uh, the Atlanta Hawks. Tony went on to start a company called Aries Capital Management as well. So, a serious who's who of billionaires uh, list, you know, are on the Apollo founding list. So, I'll start here. Joe, do you see that as a real estate holding company, a golf operations company? How do you see Club Corp? Yeah, it's probably a little bit of both. And our old uh, colleague at the PGA Tour, David Pillsbury, runs it now um, out of Dallas. So, uh, Pills was one of the guys you know, kind of in the running for uh, Tim Fincham's job when he, when he retired and um, he left after Jay Monahan was appointed. Um, he left and he, and he went to, uh, he got recruited to, to do this and he was at American golf prior. And then he ran, you know, kind of the, the TPC network. Um, and, you know, he's, he's, I caught up with him, you know, it's been a couple months ago, but they were in the middle of their IPO. Obviously, the market's changed, but um, so from 2007 through 2000, you know, call it 19, you had a net 115 golf courses a year um, closed down, and golf courses became real estate projects. And and you know, so during that time, the supply and demand dynamic of these private clubs came back into balance and almost the balance shifted to the owner operators as opposed to, you know, and everywhere you go now in these major cities, um, I mean, look, there's waiting lists upon waiting lists on, on golf clubs. And so, yeah, I, I, I'm very bullish on that. In fact, I think this week, um, Jordan Spieth announced that he was invested and I think he's becoming an ambassador to invited clubs. So, um, you know, I, th I think they've got a pretty long runway, even if we go through a, pretty hard recession. I just think that, um, you know, you've got, you've got a lot of demand because it, when you have 110 to 115 courses closed per annum over a 10, 12 year period, you, you get to the supply and demand, uh, balance pretty quick. So, so Joe, put this into context. I want to go back to the numbers that were cited earlier. Yeah. So purchased in 2017, five years ago for 1.1 billion. Considering yeah. a four point five billion IPO five years later, so that's a four x cash on cash investment, higher on the equity side because Roberto said there's leverage there. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yes, assuming they can get that price right. I mean, I think that that is probably interest rates act like gravity on asset prices. So when they filed their S one, which is their precursor to the IPO. The interest, I don't know if, I don't know when that was, that was maybe in February or March, the Fed hasn't started, hadn't started raising rates. And so they're not going to get, if they thought they could get four and a half billion in March, they're probably going to get less than three now. Um, and that's just what interest rates do. They Interest rates do that on asset classes. So it's, it's, it's still a home run. 
and they timed it great 2017. Um, now, I mean, they own the Hills of Lakeway, which is a Austin development here. But I mean, they have they're going to have a waiting list to get in those two clubs, and they've probably they're going to be able to bump initiation fees. Even in this market, they're going to be able to bump them probably 150 percent from where they were previous to what they when they put the money in. I think I know the answer, Joe, based on your uh, your your tone so far. But are you buying or selling? Yeah, I would, I would, I would, I would buy. I wouldn't buy it at four and a half billion, but I would definitely buy it. Um, I, I would buy it at a price. I mean, it's, it's, it's. I, I think the private club market is very well, very well situated. Um, you know, for the next five or ten years. What's interesting about all of these companies we've talked about so far is the timing of like COVID golf boom and economic cycles, especially COVID golf boom. Like, I was reading an article about Dix in 2014. They overbought on inventory and they were selling drivers for $99. And then, you know, some of these clubs, like you said, for 10 years, they were closing and then COVID hits golf booms. And it's so sticky is my opinion. Like we're still on the er we're still early on the other side to see if it sticks, but once people play, they get addicted to it. Uh, it's just completely changed all of these businesses, right? Completely changed them. I agree. And 2014 is interesting. I mean, you were you were in the height of your powers of the PGA Tour, I think, in 2014, Roberto. But you know, you um, relative powers. But yes, yeah. that, that was the year that TaylorMade decided it was a great idea to have two drivers introduced, one at the beginning of the year and one at the end of the year. So these these retailers, you know, and they were forcing these drivers down the retailers' throat, and that's where they got the expanded inventory because, you know, I think. They Taylor May got a little aggressive back then, and that's you know, right. The cycle used to be every eighteen months they'd come out, and then they'd come out with a new driver. You know, for the tour players, every January, you, you know, you get to the Bob Hope, which is now the American Express, and you'd get a new driver, and you'd be like, "This is awesome." But then that year, or maybe it was two thousand thirteen, I forget which one. But Taylor May got to they were introducing one in January, and then they introduced one in like September. You're like, whoa, hold on here. So now you're now you're forcing the computer consumer. They're like, well, I only have six months and I gotta wait for this driver that was introduced in January to be discounted. So Taylor made almost introduced, it was a really, in my opinion, a very bad mistake by Mark King, one of his few bad mistakes. But he he taught the consumer to wait. Yeah. All of a sudden, when you teach the consumer to wait, then you got a discount. And that's when, that's when you, you know, that's when Dick's got in their big, big problem with $99 drivers. Yeah. They went from the R5 to the R11 in like two weeks. It was like, wait, how did we just get yeah, from R5 yeah. to R11? And that, that, that was, I'll never forget getting the driver where they painted it white. Yes. And I was like, we're at the stage where paint is now innovation. And um, it was, uh, yeah, it was great though. As a paid endorser, I thought it was a brilliant strategy. Yeah. Well, that's a good segue into sticking with equipment. The next company you wanted to profile is Miura Golf. And for those who don't know the name, Miura is a super ultra premium club maker based in Japan. They focus a ton on forged irons. We're talking about $500 per club in many instances here. Question for both of you. Do you know who owns Miura? Yes or no? I think it's a Miura family. I don't know. There's a Mr. Miura, I know. So it's unclear. Um, so it started with Mr. Miura, Miura San started the company as he worked for another golf company back in 1958. So he stumbled into the passion for clubs when he made clubs for Morita golf, which I'd never heard of. Then Miura San assumed the role of chairman in 2010. His son, Shine was named the president of Miura manufacturing along with his brother, uh, Yoshitaka. The Miura company continues to set the bar with all respect to forging companies. Here's some other stuff. So, so you can see a real, I'm imagining a real like Jiro dreams of sushi, right? Like passing on the, like the craft of the work, passing it down to um, uh, just family members. So Joe, that would suggest that you're right. However, in 2017, Howard Milstein, co-chairman of the Nicholas Companies and chairman, president of CEO of the country's largest of New York private bank and trust, acquired the rights to distribute Miura Golf in the U.S. and beyond. So the ownership is really unclear because you've got the family in the manufacturing business. You've got now an owner um, buying the distribution rights. It's a very hybrid model, and it's really hard to get more details on it. But I thought that was a very that's a that's a structure I personally never heard of. Maybe you guys have, but that was fascinating to me. Yeah, no, it's the the the, the Japanese structures are kind of interesting. I mean, they're kind of they are kind of black boxes, right? I mean, you you uh, 
because you go you go that you go and you look at some of these Japanese companies and they're trading for more cash than than the, than the market value and they make money it's so you're like wow this is great but they don't it's a it's an interesting their their idea of shareholder value is a little bit different than the American um, so you, you you never know kind of what you're getting and the Japanese courts do not like the American investor very much <laughs> so it's a uh, um, it's it's a uh, it's a it's a difficult one, but it's interesting. I mean, that is a super. I mean, I think I think a set of clubs, you know, pitching wedge through, call it three iron or pitching wedge through four iron would be about you know thirty five hundred bucks all in, um, with some slight customization and things like that. I mean, that's a you know that's a that's a interesting and that that premiumization of golf is. Um, I mean, look, Bob Parsons started it right. Um, well- and I'll, I'll do all due respect. Miro was started in 1958. So I, I know, but I mean, he, he, but Bob Parsons basically made it mainstream. Yeah. Right? There you where, go. where spending $3,500 for a set of irons wasn't, wasn't crazy. And, um, you know, I think that, and then Titleist came up with the idea concept. Um, so the, the, these, uh, Miro may have started it globally or, you know, they may have been the first in Japan. And I think the Japanese consumer, um, they were willing to buy a little bit higher end product before the Americans were were willing to buy a higher end product. Yeah. But we just didn't have that. We didn't have that attention to detail to to um, you know before. Wasn't there always these rumors that like they were the ones that made Tiger's irons and that Tiger always played mirrors that were stamped with Nike on them and all that? I mean, I have no idea whether that's true or not. But and I'm not an equipment right. junkie, but. I know like my junkie friends like always have held Mira in very high esteem. And there was a lot of rumors around that stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, and, 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 you know, those, I mean, I remember when J drivers came out, Rob, Roberto, you're probably a little too young for those J drivers, but that, I mean, that was like, whenever you got, um, whenever you got these, you know, every now and again, they would come out on tour and there would be this, this guy coming and no one has ever seen him and he'd have a sack full of clubs and they were Japanese based clubs and they'd even have, they'd have shafts that were all in Japanese. And you'd look at this thing and there'd be like, Oh my gosh, this, this must be something like even tour pros were salivating over these clubs. I laid my eyes in the first set of Mira irons I've ever seen last week. And it was a buddy of mine. We were playing simulator golf. I mean, it's like I was holding a samurai sort of thing. It was a thing <laughs> of beauty. Yeah. Now when I put it down, it was the most like the, butteriest little blade ever i wanted nothing to do with it my buddy's a 13 handicap who is an equipment junkie so this this felt like totally like a vanity purchase because he couldn't find the club face with it either but by god was that thing beautiful yeah so you dug in and found something that they also partnered with true spec golf and that the quote was they aim to bring their branding and their marketing up to par with the quality of the product so tell me more about what did you find out about that so this goes back to the evolution of management we talked about with Millar. So when when Howard Milstein bought the company, he he didn't want to run it himself. He hired who the, the guy who was the founder of True Spec Golf, right? One of those like fitting shops we talked about in chains to run the distribution rights from Eura. Okay. So maybe that's why we are all starting to see, and Joe, you mentioned seeing it more pop up more and more. That that was a that was an evolution, at least a complement to what Yurasan and company were doing in Japan to really professionalize their distribution. So that was, huh. so that, so, you know, I, so TrueSpec sold to uh, the parent company that owns golf.com and golf magazine. And then the founder then found his way into Mira and in running the distribution business. You know, the best marketing in the world for Mira is when you see your buddy with a set of Miras and you're like, oh my gosh, where did you go with that? And if he would have said it's invitation only, you can't get some. That is the best marketing in the world because now all of a sudden you're like, well, how do I get in the, on the invite list? But on the hard goods space, you know, Bob Parsons, you spend a billion dollars in the hard goods space, you, you can put a dent in someone's sales. Um, it's a very difficult business. So, and there's always there's always a rich guy. It's like restaurants, right? There's always another reason restaurant business is so hard. There's always like. 10 guys that are willing to put in 50 to hundred grand to start up a new restaurant. That's right. And the problem with it is the 50 to hundred grand check. If it was a million dollars, the restaurant business would be a lot better um, because there's not, there's only so many people who can write a million dollar check, but there's a lot of people that can write a $50,000 check, especially if they can get a table and they get like a, you know, 25% discount on their meal They're They can kind of justify it. Right. But if it was a million dollars, 
restaurants will be in a lot better business because there'll just be fewer of them. The hard goods space, there's always a, there's always another guy. There's always another Bob Parsons. They're gonna be like, you know what? I kind of want to I kind of want to do this. Um, well, it's even worse in soft goods, right? So we'll get even this, worse this, in soft goods. That's exactly right. It's a good segue to the next company we'll talk about. But I, I saw there's a guy on Twitter who covers like menswear, and he was saying that the barriers to entry now are so low. You just have to find a factory. If the three of us want to start a hat company, we just go find the factory. We put our name like. There's only like three hat factories in the world. So it's such a low barrier to entry. There's always a new brand, right? And hard goods is maybe a little tougher, but you're, you're right. It's uh, I never thought about it in the restaurant space, but it makes a lot of sense. Guys, hats with big block letters on the front. What do you guys think? <laughs> I, it, so, it, 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 yeah. <laughs> I have to bring this up. One of the best tweets of the year was like, uh, Somebody said, let's hope 2023 is the year like these hats go to die. And my buddy sent it to me and he said, I love those hats. I know that I don't want to talk to that guy. That hat tells me that I don't want to talk to that guy. I don't have to waste my time to figure out that I don't like him. And I was like, oh, that's a good point. <laughs> it's a, it's a, I forget who it was. I think it was like, is it Anna Kendrick or Hendrick Kendrick? The movie, the, 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 the anyway, movie star. I, yeah. Yeah. The movie star. She's great. But she was like, she goes, I just want to thank Apple for making available a gold, a solid gold band for an iWatch. He goes, she goes, now I can identify anyone who does that as just immediate douchebag and I don't have to talk to him ever again. That's right. <laughs> it's like someone somewhat similar. Let's go back to Mira for a little yeah. bit. So so you mentioned something, Joe, in the Golf Galaxy conversation that like, hey, if we end up in a recession that's prolonged, you would expect sales to go down, et cetera. One of the sort of memes in the last few recessions has been luxury, ultra luxury is protected from some of the recessionary brands. So would you would you project an impact a downward impact to demand to Mira if we hit a recession? Probably not as much because their consumer is not nearly as affected by a recession as as a you know kind of mid mid market high end consumer, right? That's the ultra high end. I consider Mira as the ultra high end consumer, and then ultra high end consumer, while they're affected and they might not, you know, they may not. Uh, the good news is it used to be, you remember 2009, there was articles in the Wall Street Journal and New York Times where people did not want to have an Hermes bag or an LVMH bag walking down Fifth Avenue because they thought that that was somewhat pretentious in a, in a you know, giant recession. Um, the good news is Mira, it doesn't come with a bag. You just get a nice set of irons. You put them in your golf bag and, and, and it looks like you've had them for a while. So it's, um, I, I don't think that they're as nearly as affected as a, as a normal golf you know, hard, hard goods, um, company. And the question is, you know, getting back to it is Mr. Miura and his sons, is it going to be like the Solheim family that owns ping, right? Are they going to be, are they going to continue throughout the generations? And is the next generation as passionate as, as the previous generation. And that's, you know, starting in 1958, you know, that's, uh, what is that? 60, 62 years ago. Uh, sorry, 60, 64 years ago is my understanding. There would be no math. Um, so I don't know. It, um, it's interesting, you know, how you, how you pass that down, that brand down and are, is the next generation going to protect it like the previous generation? Um, but I don't think Mira is affected. They're not as affected by, by, by a giant recession. So are we buying or are we selling yeah, that's interesting. I I I I think the hard goods space is really difficult. I mean, I'm not a I'm not a giant I'm not a giant buyer here. Um, I love I love it. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. But I, I wouldn't buy. I think it's just very very difficult. Again, you get into that that I reference Bobby Dean that that scrappy entrepreneur. Um, if you were buying it, you'd want the you'd want the whole family involved, and you'd have to figure it. And the key thing, if you did buy it. The key thing would be, how do you keep the family involved and how do you incentivize them? Is if you had to buy it, how do you keep that family incentivized to, to keep doing what they're doing and still love that brand and still make it their baby? Because they've, they've got their cash out of it. And so you got to figure out those incentive structures and what they're and how they're incentivized. All right, Joe, we'll close with a fun one. Sweetens Cove. So for listeners who aren't familiar, this is a nine hole golf course in South Pittsburgh, Tennessee. Tiny little off the beaten path place that Rob Collins and Tad King basically like rebuilt with their bare hands. And it's become kind of a cult 
favorite in golf. Who owns it? An investor group bought or co-invested with the two owners in 2019. That group includes Andy Roddick, Mark Rivers, Tom Nolan, former Ralph Lauren guy, and Peyton Manning. Uh, Rivers is a real estate investor from California who is quoted as saying, this might be the future of golf. Here's the interesting thing. They launched a whiskey in 2020. So as part of the brand and what is Sweetens Cove, there's now Sweetens Cove whiskey. It's super high end, $200 a bottle. So interestingly, I found an article that in November of this year, they partnered with Advanced Spirits, which provides capital, supply, and recipes. So back to our previous conversation of all you got to do is find a factory. They're taking this, like they're, I'm just shocked that it's like, there's a website that's like, Hey, don't waste your money on like barrels and whatnot. We'll finance it. Hey, supply, we'll find you the aged whiskey. Like Sweetens Cove is not making whiskey that will advanced spirits. will find it for you. And Hey, we'll help you hone your recipe. Like it just takes so much of the allure off for me as a consumer. But, you know, I remember talking to a buddy about this acquisition and he turned to me and he goes, you think Peyton Manning can sell some Tennessee whiskey? So in light of all that, you know, you got a 50 acre, nine hole golf course, but you've got this kind of unlimited ceiling with the spirits company, but you know, every celebrity has a spirits company. Uh, I, I think it's a really fun one to watch and, and to end this conversation with. Yeah. And, it, and at $200 a bottle, the, the margins on that will make your eyes water. I mean, right. they, um, it, it, it is, um, it is a thing of beauty as they say, but um yeah, you know, whiskey is interesting in a sense that it's one of the only things that the older the inventory, the more it's worth. I mean, it's a very interesting kind of like uh, wines a little bit like that as well. Um, so when you're spinning up a brand, you're spinning up a whiskey brand or whatever. If you want to spin it up in the first year, you need you need kind of pre-blended and all that kind of stuff. And then you hopefully you're aging the barrels and you're aging the blend and you're, you're leaving that in some, you know, probably some Kentucky or Tennessee warehouse. Um, and that, you know, maybe in five years, you'll get this Sweetens Cove, you know, five-year-old, uh, that type of thing. But um, the golf course I haven't played, but Kings Collins, I read the book. It's a fabulous, you know, a fabulous book. Ken, uh, you know, Tom Nolan's a friend. He ran Ralph Lauren USA. Now he's running Kendra Scott, which is based here in Austin. Um, and a few other friends of mine that are members of Austin Golf Club, you know, are kind of part of that investor group. But it's, it's. Um, I mean, look, it's, I think it's, we talked about it, you know, prior to the recording is I think there's a lottery now to get on it. It's, um, it's this, um, you know, it's, it's like this special enchanted place that you you've got to go i mean there's a there's a whole brand around the sweden's cove now yeah. all right so maybe you have some inside info since you know a few of the investors or what would you do with it if you were an investor do you just hey we're gonna the cap the ceiling is so low on a nine hole golf course like that's just gonna do what it does right and then do you focus on the whiskey business do you try to recreate this concept do you try to go find some little nine holer in west texas somewhere and do the same thing like what would you do to get some return on your investment. Yeah, I I think it's one of those things where I mean all these guys are are they're, they're not uh, wondering where their next meal is. That's right. Uh, if you know what I mean. And so I think that um I think they're doing it number one they love golf. Number two um they'll probably get a return. But I think, you know, when my I I played Bannon Dunes when Mike Kaiser when it was only one golf course. And I think we played it. He had I think Brian Hanniger put on, on a group out there and Mike invited, there was only, I want to say there was only probably 20 of us and maybe it had been open for a week or no one had ever heard of Brent Bannon Dunes yet. And he had talked about, you know, if I could just break even at this place, um, <laughs> he's, he's doing just fine. But I think that what they have and the brand that Sweetens Cove has is that like, look, this is re for, if you love golf, this is a really cool place. And it's not about, you know, it's, it's not about bow ties and huge service. It's just like, look, we developed a really cool golf experience and you kind of get lost in it. Right. Is, and is the whiskey to Sweetens Cove, what AWS is to Amazon? Well, it could be, I mean, it very well could be, and you've got the right guys, right? I mean, Peyton and Andy and, um, you know, those guys are, are kind of, um, 
I mean, they're influencers and they're, you know, I think, I think it very well could be the, the better analog would be what um, Casamigos is to Discovery Land Company. Yeah. Sweden's Cove whiskey is to um, Sweden's Cove. Tizo's Vodka here in Austin also is, Austin has a lot of entrepreneurial activity, um, but um, Tito's Vodka here, not nearly as high end. He, they went, he went completely mass market, but he was also the first kind of craft vodka yeah. that really launched. And um, so that, that mass market appeal and the attainability for the average consumer to attain what's, what everyone views as a little bit of a higher end product is, is a really, really powerful thing. The great thing about liquor is we were um, visiting my daughter in Switzerland. Uh, she's studying abroad and you pass a bar in Switzerland. Not that my wife and I went to a bar in Switzerland, but you pass a bar in Switzerland. I mean, the bar is not different than if you passed a bar here in Austin, Texas or in Atlanta or Boston, or you go to Hong Kong those brands are more or less the same. And that's the beauty of liquor. Liquor, liquor, for whatever reason, everybody's palate is the same. You go to you go to Switzerland, you have chocolate, and you go to America and you have chocolate, two totally different tastes. Right. But liquor, for whatever reason, everyone has the same taste buds when it comes to liquor. And that's the that's the power of it. I will know in a hundred years from now. I can tell you that people would be drinking Johnny Walker and Johnny Walker Blue. I have no idea if Apple will exist. I have no idea. Right. I will guarantee you that that, that Johnny Walker Blue and Johnny Walker Black will exist. Um, Something that, uh, as an aside with Sweetens Cove, I think it's definitely worth playing if you go, if you're in the area, if you're in the Southeast. I wouldn't fly from California to come play Sweetens Cove, but it is... I think probably underrated in the effect it's had on golf and something Dan and I follow closely. Like a hoopie is, is just a five-star version of Sweeten's Cove. And now you've got the tree farm, the Zach Blair thing. It's all about the hang. Like I really don't think some days I'm like rolling my eyes. Like it's this nine hole course, like, okay, get over it folks. Like there's a million great golf courses in the world, but I, I really do think, I mean, tell me where I'm wrong, but it was a major inflection point in golf experience where people wanted a simpler low key hang. Like they wanted to, you know, I think it had a lot to do with like, you can wear hoodies and you can wear like it, you know, I guess there's that place in California, like goat Hill park or whatever, but yeah, it didn't, yeah. I think sweetens has, has a big stake in the ground and the kind of evolution of the golf experience. I think that, I think that's right. And I think that, um, you know, I guess it probably started 1996 with, um, a little bit different, but uh, 1996 with uh, the the Crenshaw Core Course in Nebraska, Sand uh, Hills, yeah, uh, Sand Hills, and then you know Mike Kaiser brings on Bannon Dunes. But then what what Sweetens really did was it kind of made the hips hipsters and yeah. the guy in the in the kind of you know the random the random golf club guy, yeah, uh, it kind of made that like you know I'm going to go somewhere and it's just it's not pretentious. I can go be myself can do whatever I want. You know, I can, I can, I just love the game of golf and I want to go to like-minded individuals and kind of all gather at a place. And it's, you know, Harvey Pinnock said it, Austin, Texas, um, <laughs> if you play golf, you're my friend. And I think it's a little bit of, if you play golf, you're my friend. And if you play golf here, not only are you my friend, but it's like, it's easy. Like I know we, we are like-minded individuals and we're, yeah. and we're all, all coming to this place and we're coming to it because you know it 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 checks a lot of our boxes that's important to us it represents a, a new population in the game and i think you can chart their trajectory and their goals and their dreams in golf down two different paths i think the golfer the new generation that loved sweetens cove and like connected with sweetens cove their dream is to like join in a hoopie or join a tree farm and go to these cool places and as they progress in the game they're going to buy certain clothes. They're going to take certain trips. They're going to join certain clubs. And that's completely different than the track that wants to join. Like I would say the heritage clubs here in Atlanta, that golfer has no interest in joining the Cherokees and the Piedmont driving clubs and the Austin golf clubs. Like that's just not their scene. It's not a dream of theirs. I think they'd rather join, you know, take Augusta out of it. Like they don't want to join Marion. They want to join like, I, I, hoopie, I, I, right and i think that it's a it's really you got two different consumers now and and 
the fork in the road was Sweeten's band in kind of that whole thing. Yeah, I think I think that's that's really well said and really I, you know I hadn't thought about it to that extent, but I think it's I think that's really well really well said because there's I had a conversation with a with an incredibly good amateur. I mean, he's won Crump Cup and things like that, and um, I was asking him, I'm like, well, you seem to be kind of on that. Um, won the Coleman. Um, you seem to be on that. You know, are you going to join Seminole? And he's like, ah, I don't know. I kind of like to play golf with my sh- shirt out. I like to have a few beers. I like to, you know, kind of have you know music and things like that. And he goes, I just don't think that I fit. And before, like that, twenty years ago, that would have been like, what do you? What? No, yeah, no. You know, he goes, there's plenty of options. That's right. And, and I think that you're right. I mean, I hadn't thought about it like that, but he said this to me, you know, this was nine months ago. And, um, you know, you, you, you kind of putting a bow tie on, it makes a lot of sense to me. And it's, it's, there's two different, yeah, there's two different paths. And what do you, what do you want? Right. Uh, it's not, you know, the, the great thing about it is golf is no longer homogenous. It's, 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 there's a lot of different pathways in the game. Totally. Okay, so you're a buyer, yeah. you, you anticipated my I'm question, buyer you're buying Sweet & Cove, but I got a couple caveats because I'm picking up on some of your patterns here, Joe. Are you <laughs> buying Sweet & Cove if you can't keep Peyton, Andy Roddick, and the All-Star team beside you? Yeah, I I, I think that's beyond it, right? I, I think if, um, look, if I was buying Pebble Beach and I didn't have Clint Eastwood and, and I mean, Dick Ferris just passed away and uh, Peter Uberoff, um, I, I don't think it matters, Pebble Beach. And I think Sweetens Clove has now gotten to the point where, you know, I don't think I could screw it up. Yeah. As long as I was, as long as I didn't want to go put a, you know, Ritz Carlton in front of it or something like that. As long as I keep it as is, we know what the brand is and we don't try to screw that up. Now, I think I'd buy the golf course and not the whiskey because I do think you need, I do think Peyton and, and and Andy and those guys bring a lot to the game with the whiskey, but the golf course, as long as you are good stewards, I, I think that's, that's something that's kind of interesting. And it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's going, I think it's going to become a trophy as, uh, asset in the yeah. game of golf for, you know, a certain type of person. Yeah. So it's, it's a, a ham good. sandwich kind of business. Took the words out of my mouth, ham sandwich business. Ham sandwich business. There's a lot of those. There's there's a few of those in golf. Um, it's usually at the upper echelons. Like um, organizations are somewhat ham sandwich like. Um, but uh, that's another topic. <laughs> well, for the listener who didn't catch the reference, episode one, Joe introduced this to me and to us as a, something he learned from Warren Buffett. It was a business so easy to run, even a ham sandwich could do it. Yeah. And I think he referred to it as like you want to buy a business that your idiot nephew could run it. Um, <laughs> because eventually he will. You know, I think that Sweetens Cove is one of those. Um, I mean, look, it's an amazing property. And like we said, it, it's in a floodplain. I mean, it gets flooded a lot. And yeah. uh, it's 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 a, it's a jewel of the game. I can't wait to play it. Well, Joe, it's been incredible to kick these conversations around with you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. I always value your perspective. Uh, if anyone's, you know, looking to, move austin texas call joe we'll put his cell phone number in the show notes i'm just kidding but yeah uh, yeah yeah call me i got the i got a direct line of the chamber we can uh we can do a nice put a nice package for your business together and um we're look we're, we're looking for more people <laughs>